Hello my friends, and welcome. Did you know that approximately 300 women took part in the Easter Rising? And many were combatants in the Irish Civil War too. Apart from Countess Constance Markovich, how many do you know? 300 women participated in Ireland's 1916 Easter Rising. Perhaps the best known is Countess Constance, who fought for the duration of the conflict, in Stephen's Green. Then there was Elizabeth O'Farrell, the nurse who delivered Padraig Pierce's note to surrender to the British forces. But there are many more extraordinary stories of women who bravely aided and fought, in both wars. Soldiers and civilians alike, picked up their weapons, as men, women, and children showed that they were willing to give their lives for their freedom. One of the biggest challenges wasn't just finding people willing to fight but arming them, and that task fell to a handful of people that were risking their lives before the first shot was even fired. The role of women in frontline combat is one that has been historically overlooked. Relegated to providers of medical aid and similar kinds of support. It's only recently that stories of some pretty incredible women are getting the credit, they've long been due. From gunrunners, to frontline fighters, here are a few of their stories of courage. By the time of the Easter Rising, Helena Maloney was already a well-known actress who took her politics to the stage. A part of the Abbey Theatre, she was an incredibly outspoken proponent of nationalist ideals, putting them on the stage, where she could reach countless people. Stuck in France at the beginning of World War I, and her involvement with the Abbey Theatre, had earned her another gig helping with the organization of the theatre troupe into a military division of the Irish Citizen Army, all at the request of James Connolly. Her work in the theatre meant that she was pretty much expected to travel all across Europe, and when it came to weapons smuggling, it was a huge bonus. In the first days of 1916, the rebels were concentrating on arming their men, and women. Helena was instrumental in that even being sent to London on a trip to requisition some firearms. The guns were simply carried in her suitcase, which they hoped wouldn't be searched by British officials who would have no reason to suspect a theatre actress, was a gun runner. Not only was she not searched, but a polite British army recruit was kind enough to carry her bags to the ferry. The days leading up to the rising, were filled with cooking, and other preparation work, but when the time came, Helena donned a rather smart tweed outfit, most likely from the theatre costume department, then she grabbed a gun and joined the group that stormed Dublin Castle. The assault failed, because of nothing more than a split-second hesitation, which she would later say was the instant that the armed volunteers truly realised what they were in the middle of enacting, but Helena and her contingent retreated to City Hall, which she soon left to run for reinforcements. When she returned their commander Sean Connolly, was killed by sniper fire, and the group remained under gun and cannon fire throughout the night. As British troops advanced on the tenuous stronghold, the mostly unarmed group, surrendered. The prisoners were dealt with amidst the assumption that the women were only present as nurses and medical support, not as the front-line combatants that they were. Ultimately, they were eventually transferred to Kilmainham. Helena was released in December of 1916. Sadly though, soon after the conflict of the Rising another war was on the horizon. The Irish Civil War, from June 1922 to May 1923, was a conflict that followed the Irish War of Independence, and accompanied the establishment of the Irish Free State an entity independent from the United Kingdom, but still within the British Empire. The civil war was waged between two opposing groups, the pro-treaty provisional government and the anti-treaty Irish Republican Army, over the Anglo-Irish Treaty. The forces of the provisional government, which became the Free State in December 1922, supported the treaty, while the anti-treaty opposition saw it as a betrayal of the Irish Republic. Many of those who fought on both sides in the conflict had been members of the IRA, during the War of Independence. 
The civil war was won by the pro-treaty Free State forces, who benefited from substantial quantities of weapons provided by the British government. Josie McGowan was from Dolphin's Barn, Dublin and had served as a member of the Marrow Bone Lane Garrison, during the 1916 Rising. On the 22nd of September 1918, Josie attended a Kim and Noor Amban rally at Foster Place to protest against the internment of Republican prisoners, jailed as part of the so-called German plot. The Dublin Metropolitan Police Baton charged the assembly, and during their onslaught a constable struck Josie several times on the head with his baton. Josie's comrades rescued her from the assault and took her to their medical outpost in Ticknock. She died there on 29 September 1918 and was buried in Glasnevin Cemetery. Her father suffered huge emotional trauma at his loss. He died a week later, aged just 46 years old. They are both buried in the same grave in Glasnevin. Over two decades later Josie was posthumously awarded a War of Independence Service Medal, which included a Comrack Bar, an award normally reserved for male combatants. The second woman killed was Margaret Keogh, a 19-year-old printer's assistant. Margaret was fatally wounded by a gunshot in her home at Stella Gardens, in Rings End, at 11.15 p.m. on 10 July 1921, during a series of raids by the British forces on the eve of the truce which ended the War of Independence. She died the day after the ceasefire began. If there was one woman who embodied all the various strands entwined in the Irish Revolution, it was Margaret. Margaret was the captain of the Croak Ladies Hurling Club, a member of the Irish Clerical Workers' Union and was an active member of Kim and Namban. A year prior to her death, Margaret had been arrested by the British forces for refusing to give her name in English, when questioned about her fundraising activities. Her funeral took place at Glasnevin, on 14 July 1921, and she was buried with military honours. Today her grave is marked by a humble headstone bearing the inscription, Margaret Keogh, died for Ireland. During the truce period a further three women were killed. Margaret McAnany was accidentally shot dead by an IRA volunteer whilst delivering dispatches at Burnford, Donegal, on 31 May 1922. The same day Margaret McLeodough died of an accidental gunshot wound whilst transporting a gun for the IRA in County Tyrone. Another member of Kim and Namban, Nora O'Leary died in similar circumstances, the same year when she was accidentally shot dead in her home, when an IRA commandant, Dennis Breen, accidentally discharged his rifle. Either because of political idealism, or more likely military necessity, women were allowed to play a fuller military role during the Civil War. Elizabeth Maguire acted as a quartermaster for the IRA's Dublin Brigade and was involved in 28 attacks on Free State troops. Sheila Humphreys led an armed women's unit in a raid on a hospital in October 1922 in an attempt to free a wounded IRA volunteer, guarded by Free State soldiers. The following month she was involved in a gun battle with the Free State Army when they captured Ernie O'Malley the IRA's Assistant Chief of Staff. It is unsurprising therefore that Kim and Namban fatalities doubled during the Civil War. The first member killed in that conflict was Mary Hartney. On 4 August 1922, the Free State Army used artillery to drive the IRA, from the town of Adair, the Dunraven Arms Hotel, where the Republicans had set up their military headquarters and suffered a direct hit during the opening barrage. 
A short time later a correspondent from the Free State Army's publicity department reported that, all the rooms in the building were found to be bespattered with blood, showing that there must have been fairly severe casualties amongst the irregulars. In fact only one member of the garrison had been killed, Mary Hartney. She had been working as part of a first aid unit and was killed instantly in an explosion caused by the shell fire. Mary was buried in the Republican plot of Mount St. Lawrence Cemetery, in Limerick, on 7 August 1922. The next member to be killed by the Free State Army was Lily Bennett from Orham Street, Dublin. The Republican Prisoners' Defence Committee held a public rally each Sunday, on O'Connell Street. On 18 November 1922, Lily was attending the demonstration when Free State troops attacked the protesters. An eyewitness told the Irish Times, the meeting had only lasted about five minutes, when a lorry of national troops attended by an armoured car, came along from the direction of Pinell Square and halted beside the gathering. An officer ordered the meeting to disperse. Revolver shots rang out, evidently fired by supporters of the meeting. The huge crowd began to break up amid great confusion. A machine gun was drained on the crowd, and an unnerving rattle of fire was next heard, and people trampled on one another in the panic. Charlotte Dispard, who had been addressing the meeting, later insisted that the Free State Army had opened fire without provocation. Seven people were seriously wounded in the attack, including Lily Bennett who had been shot in the back and died a short time later. Margaret Dunn, from Capilla E South, near Castletown in West Cork, was shot dead by the Free State Army six months later. On 8 April 1923, a Free State soldier was wounded during a gunfight with two IRA volunteers at Edrigol. Ten minutes later the Free State troops spotted Dunn conversing with a third IRA volunteer, who had not been involved in the attack. In an apparent act of reprisal for the wounding of his comrade, Captain Hassett of the Free State Army drew a gun and opened fire on the two, shooting Margaret Dunn dead. Throughout the Civil War Kiman Namban had rendered military honours at the funerals of IRA volunteers killed in action. But for Dunn's funeral the situation was reversed as the men of the IRA came out of hiding, and risked capture and execution to pay tribute, to their fallen female comrade. The final member to die as a result of the conflict appears to have been Annie Nan Hogan, from Cratlow in County Clare. Nan had organised safe houses during the War of Independence and was leader of the East Clare Brigade of Cuman Namban. Later in 1922 the Republican prisoners in Limerick Prison had organised an escape attempt by digging a tunnel. However the plot was betrayed and on the night of the escape attempt Free State soldiers arrested seven women outside the prison including Nan. She was interned without trial in Kilmainham jail and went on hunger strike in March 1923 for better conditions and prisoner of war status. Eventually the hunger strike was called off when it became obvious that the Free State authorities would not concede their demands. Unfortunately, this development was too late to save Annie Hogan. She was released in September 1923 and died a short time later. Her family and friends attributed the 24-year-old's premature death to her hunger strike, and the conditions she had suffered in prison. The conflict claimed more lives than the War of Independence that preceded it, and left Irish society divided and embittered for generations. And that my friends is another of my stories, thank you for watching. Bye for now.